All right, aloha everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties we had going on a little bit earlier. Um, my name is Callie Crowder. I'm one of the remote observers here at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual star party for CFHT. Today we have our Ask an Astronomer. So this is definitely one of the favorites that we've had for um, our uh, in-person star parties is for people to come up and be able to ask astronomers uh, what they do, what their job is like. So today we have two fantastic guests with us. One is Dr. Nandi Manset and the other is Dr. Lori rousseau Nefton. And both of them are actually Canadian resident astronomers here at CFHT. So thank you for joining us, guys. Yeah, hi, thanks for having us. So first thing I want to do is ask you guys to do a short introduction for us and tell you, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, yourselves, the kind of research you do. So let's pass it over to uh, Nadine first. All right. My name is Nadine and I have been at CFHT as a resident astronomer for a little over 20 years, so quite a long time. I was born and raised in Montreal, Canada. That's where I went to school. That's where I did all my studies in physics and astronomy at Université de Montréal. And as soon as I finished my PhD, I flew to Hawaii for my very first job, which was to be a resident astronomer at CFHT. So over the years, I have been given different duty. Early on, I was just responsible for one instrument then I got involved in a project for a new instrument. Then I got to oversee the whole observing process. And now I also supervise the whole astronomy group. So we have um, six or seven resident astronomers and one of them is Lori. And I have great pleasure to work with her. So maybe Lori, now it's your turn. Thank you, Stetson. Yes, so I'm also a resident astronomer and I'm as well from Canada. I've been in Hawaii for almost four years now. Um, and I came here right after finishing my, my PhD. Uh, so it's my first job. And it was actually the exact job that I wanted. It was my top one. <laughs> I wanted to be here uh, mainly uh, because it's, it's the most magnificent place to, to do astronomy. And uh, also there is an instrument that we have at the Canada Prince Hawaii Telescope, which is called CITEL. And I have been involved in the development of that, that instrument uh, all the way up from the beginning in 2010. Uh, it took a, a long time, but we built that instrument uh, in Canada and it was shipped here at about the same time as I got the, the position. So I flew here uh, following the instrument and also following the science I love to do. Well, great. Thank you guys so much for being on today. So to start out, um, I'll just say that you guys are welcome to leave us questions in the comments below this Facebook page. If you do, we'd really like to know where you're from, um, as well as your age and your name, if you'd like to leave it for us. We want to be able to um, guide our answers to your questions towards who's asking them. So if you could leave that for us, you can start doing that right now below. That's perfect. Um, until we get there, let me start by asking you guys, what does a normal day look like for you as an astronomer? So we'll kick that back to Lori first. Okay, yeah, these days I have a lot of different tasks going on and it changes through the weeks and the months. Uh, I right now have to uh, support one of the instruments that is on, it's Espanol, a high resolution spectrograph. So it's looking at rainbows <laughs> and different stars uh, uh, one at a time. And I have to oversee uh, if the data that we're taking every night uh, look good. Uh, so I'm not observing, the remote observers are doing that. But in the morning I wake up and I look at everything that was observed and I check that everything is okay. Um, and I also have to communicate with some of the researchers around the world that are using the instrument if ever needed. And on top of that, I'm doing a little bit of science. I have uh, to uh, reduce, analyze some of the data that uh, was observed uh, and chat with some of my collaborators. Uh, so it's mainly on my computer, in front of my computer, uh, but it's, it, it changes a lot. And I do a lot of different things through the day. So that's nice. What about you, Nadine? 
very similar. I do spend a lot of time in front of my computer. Uh, I start my day by checking my email and to look for things that I have to do. For example, we support astronomers who are in Canada and in France. So if I receive an email in the morning or I read it in the morning, but it's from a Canadian astronomer, it's already late morning, early afternoon for them. If they need something from me, I'll try to reply as soon as I can so they can get the answer quickly and then continue what they were doing. Hopefully I'm helping them along the way. Today, Lori is taking care of the observations that we're going to do tonight. And tomorrow morning, she's going to pass that to me. So I'll have a shift of four or five nights. I will do exactly what she was doing, planning the observations for the night. And then after that, I'll pass that to another person. So that's something that we do regularly uh, shift so that we can plan the upcoming observations. Another thing I'm working on uh, these days, it's also preparing for the next semester. We allocate the time in chunks of six months. So one or two months before a semester starts, we have to figure out which programs we plan to observe. And then we have to let astronomers from Canada, France, University of Hawaii, and also partner um, organizations, we have to let them tell us what they want us to observe. So there's software, there's documentation, and we have to support them uh, doing that. Also, once in a while, I also chair meetings about outreach, outreach and public education. And it's a committee that has representatives of all the observatories on Mokea. We collaborate, we share ideas, we share our networks of contacts, we plan events. Nowadays, they're mostly online, and uh, but we meet every month, so I have to plan for those meetings and make sure everybody's sharing all the information that they have so we can have wonderful outreach events online. Sounds like a pretty packed schedule right now. Uh, so we have our first set of questions um, coming in. So. These are from the Waimea Country School uh, COA class. So they're grade four and five. Um, and they sent quite a few questions here. So let's start with um, how many years do you guys think it took for the universe to form? Take that one, Lori. <laughs> okay, so, so that's a really good question. Uh, and it's actually always evolving uh, with more observation. We are actually to, able to kind of estimate that, that time better. Um, nowadays, it's still believed that the universe formed about 14 billion years ago. That's a long time. <laughs> um, and one of the main observation that allows us to, to get there is by observing tons of galaxies. So we're observing like thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies around us and one of the first thing the observe uh, the, the astronomers when they started doing that when the first thing they noticed is that most of them if not all of them are kind of going away from us uh, at different speed <laughs> and uh, uh, this is actually that observation that uh, brought the idea that the, the the universe back in the days was smaller and now we're observing everything going away because it's expanding and when you're trying to trace back that moment where everything was all packed together uh you can get uh, up to the age age of the universe which is about uh 14 billion years ago a long time um another question from the same class is have you guys ever seen anything that's alive in space so any aliens out there not that I'm aware of. We, we keep looking though. We, we keep looking because we think if there's life on Earth, is there anything special about Earth? Why should Earth be special? So why shouldn't there be life elsewhere? So we start with that hypothesis that there is life elsewhere in our universe. So we keep looking for it. We keep looking for planets that are kind of like the Earth because life started on Earth, so maybe a similar planet is conducive to having life. We look for signs of life in uh, light reflected from a planet, maybe it's 
color, maybe the spectral lines, if things are changing over time that would indicate that there's something changing, maybe something alive on that planet. So we haven't found anything yet, but we keep looking. Yeah, the universe is certainly so big. To, so to imagine that there isn't anything alive out there, I mean, it'd be very special if we're the only living things in the entire universe. So what, what's the biggest thing in space besides, you know, the universe as a whole? The biggest object, the most extreme object. I love that topic. <laughs> so uh, one of the biggest objects uh, in the universe, like, like sing, single object, by that I mean you have really big galaxies, but they are formed of billions of stars. If we're looking at one single object that is like the most large thing we've ever observed. It's actually something that we can't see, but we know it's there. It's called a black hole. And some of them, uh, we know they are there because of their, uh, their gravity. They, they are heavy and massive. They don't emit any light. Light is kind of stuck inside of them. But everything that moves around them shows that they are there uh, because they're of their gravity pull. And just to give you an idea, some of them are billions of times as massive as the sun in terms of like how heavy they are. But in size, like they are larger than the solar system and it's one single object. Wow, that's really big. And it's all condensed into one area, right? All that mass yeah. in one area. Yeah. Crazy, black holes are amazing. Uh, so, do you guys know how constellations got their name? I'm curious about that too. The names of constellations depend on the civilization that happened to witness that pattern of stars. And very often it's related to myths. So myths that you have in your own culture, uh, maybe about how the the world was created, maybe something related to the seasons, maybe gods or goddesses that you have in your uh, religion. And that's how you can find patterns and then decide that it kind of looks like a bear. It kind of looks like Orion, which is a, a famous character from uh, ancient Greece. And maybe Lori, you can add a little bit related to names yeah. of constellations for First yeah. Nations in Canada. Exactly. So I, I, uh, I am from one of the First Nations in Canada and uh, there, there are many First Nations in Canada and uh, some of them have different constellations and uh, they often picture animals from the north. So uh, one of the famous one could be a caribou. Uh, we have the bear. The bear is uh, often uh, the, the, the same in, in some culture. It's like everybody was seeing the bear at the same place in the sky. Um, we have some that are smaller animals, even birds. And uh, in my community, we have one large constellation that is a canoe. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks guys. So I have a question about Venus. Can you guys tell us anything about life on Venus or the recent phosphine uh, detections that were on Venus? When astronomers look for signs of life, they try to find evidence for specific molecules. So they might be looking for traces of oxygen or ozone or other molecules like phosphine. And there's a chemical reason for that, but it's not because you see evidence of one molecule that you have evidence for life. You have to do more studies about that. And it just happened that uh, there were some observations uh, taken recently of the atmosphere of Venus and the, that molecule, phosphine, was detected. It can be related to life, uh, so that's a first sign, it's the first step towards finding life on Venus. However, uh, if that's why science is very complicated and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work, there could be other reasons for phosphine to be there. There could be just a simple geologic or chemical reaction happening without any help for, from bacteria or plants or any other living organisms. There's other ways to create that phosphine. So currently there are some astronomers who think that phosphine, yeah, is a good sign of life, but others are saying that 
No, maybe it's just a simple chemical reaction that happens to happen in the uh, atmosphere of Venus where there are a lot of different types of gases. So this is a really hot topic. Uh, we need more observations, which is something that astronomers say very often. They get data and they say, I'm not quite sure. I need more observations. I need more data because I really want to get a very good answer and look at all the different aspects to make sure that I have the correct answer. Interesting. Yeah, not to mention that temperature, uh, the temperature on Venus is like uh, when you bake a pizza in, in, in your oven. So it's like, like 400 degrees. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so if life exists there, it would be very different than what we could imagine. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, so another question people want to know is what's your educational background? I can start and Lori will probably have a very similar answer. I have a bachelor's in physics. I also did a master's and then a PhD in physics, but I specialized in astronomy. I took a lot of courses about astronomy during my graduate studies. And my thesis was about astronomy, a special type of stars. And I took a lot of data to produce some research that I published in my thesis and then in some papers. Yeah, it's the same for me. So I, I, I remember when I when I had to pick a topic for for uh, for the my my first degree, the bachelor degree. I I was um, I was really good in science in general. I was actually really good in chemistry, but I liked physics more because of the challenge of it. And so I decided to go for a bachelor in physics. And once I started it, they teach you a lot of things about mechanics, like how things move, uh, the different forces. And then you take classes about optics, like lenses and all the optical system and how light works and things like that. And, and, and then the electromagnetism, like the electricity, the, mag the, the magnets and things like that. And of course, astronomy as well. And I, was like just like my attention was drawn towards astronomy every time i needed to pick like a project to do if i if it was from from my own ideas i would definitely pick a, a project in astronomy so when i finished my my bachelor i i knew i kind of wanted to do astronomy and there was a uh, five teacher in the department there was one woman carmel robert and so i had her uh, as a professor in some classes and i felt comfortable with her so i went to chat with her and I asked her, well, would you be willing to take me as a master's student? And she, she had some ideas and it kind of all started like that. And I decided to do a project with a camera a prototype and eventually it led me to study um, star formation in the galaxy, like the galaxy behind me. So how the, the stars are forming in there. <laughs> and I love my master's degree. So I just kept going on the same topic for, for my PhD and it led me here. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so we have a question from Greg in Waikoloa, and he asked, um, we had those recent lights that went over um, Hawaii and they were big in the news. Um, so do you guys know what those ended up being? Um, and did we check it out at CFHT? Um, or do we even have the ability to look at that from our observatory? There are different types of lights that you can see in the sky. So I'm not sure exactly what Greg refers to. Um, we can see shooting stars, which are just little specks of dust that fall through our atmosphere and then they burn up on re-entry. When it's something which is really bright and lasts a long time, it can be a bigger object that is re-entering the atmosphere like a part of an old rocket. Sometimes it can be a launch of a rocket uh, or a missile uh, that can be seen from uh, your location. So there's different types of objects that you can see. There's also recently a lot of um, Starlink satellites that have been launched. I'm not sure if they are visible from Hawaii, but from elsewhere in the world, some people are seeing trains of light, like a series, a little collection like a necklace of beads of light that goes to the eye. Uh, that's 
a, a subset of complementary satellites that were all launched at the same time. And that can explain sometimes the lights that you, the see, uh, that you can see at night. Yeah, there are some in the news uh, that were from a, uh, a rocket or something, like a satellite that uh, was too old. Uh, so I remember it was supposed to go over Hawaii. I wasn't lucky enough to catch it, though. But yeah, it could be that. Yeah, there's definitely. There, yeah, um, that's. Go ahead, Nadine. Yeah, there was an, an object. Um, it was called 2020 SO. And the 2020 indicates where it, when it was discovered. So during the year 2020. And SO is probably just a series of letters to identify an object of a certain type. And that one is a near Earth object. Um, initially was discovered uh, by a telescope pan stars on, in the state of Hawaii on Haleakala. So it was discovered, people were wondering what it was. It had a little bit of a strange orbit, strange characteristics and follow-up observations confirmed that is um, the remnant of a rocket booster and something that was launched actually in the 60s. So something that was launched kind of got lost in space for a while, but then came back close enough to the earth to be captured by its gravity and then passed right under our nose, basically. Very cool. So does CFHT have the ability to track these near earth objects? You can find objects like that. Uh, there are programs that scan the sky and then compare images taken a few hours or a few days apart. And when we see a point that moves, it can be an asteroid, it can be a, a rocket booster that happened to be in our field of view. So we can make discoveries like that. And when there are especially interesting objects, we can um, then determine the orbit of that asteroid, say, by observing it night after night, see how it moves on the image. And you can figure out from how it moves on the image, how it moves in space, how far it is, what is the shape of its orbit, what is the inclination of its orbit and other characteristics like that. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Uh, so I have a question for you, Nadine. Uh, you're probably the best one to take this. So this is from Alan, and they're wondering what the latest news on TMT is. Ah, TMT, yes. Well, I don't work for TMT, so I just hear he, uh, here and there a few uh, news and updates. Sometimes I talk to colleagues who have heard uh, how things are going. Uh, TMT, because of the pandemic, um, they decided to kind of pause any activity. They were supposed to go up to the summit and start laying the, the ground, um, preparing for construction. But because of the pandemic, it's not really safe to have people interact in close quarters. So they decided to pause everything uh, to make sure that everybody is safe, is working in a safe environment. So that's why it's paused right now. And then we're like many other people from the other observatories, we're just waiting for news of what they want to do next and when they are ready to move forward. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jasmine, and she's wondering what everyone's favorite object is that they've either observed or researched. So let's shoot that over to Lori first. That's a big one. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit general. There's not like one thing. I have a favorite galaxy, which is not this one. I love this one, but I have another galaxy that I love more. It's called, a, it has a number. It's called NGC 628. You can Google it. It's a wonderful galaxy. I love that one uh, because it's probably a hundred times more massive than this guy behind me. And all the little spots, the really bright, like kind of reddish and yellow spots behind me are, are different regions where the stars are forming. Um, there is probably a, like hundreds of them in the galaxy behind me, but in NGC 628, there's like thousands of them. So it's like like a like a firework of star formation. And uh, in comparison to our own galaxy, the Milky Way, it's probably a more like a hundred times more efficient at, at forming stars. So yeah, I like that galaxy because of that. Very cool. What about you, Nadine? 
My favorite object is a star. We'll do it a little bit differently. And it's actually just a star that I picked up when I was stargazing when I was a kid. Because when you start to do stargazing and you learn to identify constellations, there's one constellation which is very easy to recognize. It's Cassiopeia. And it's in the shape of a W. That's why it's very easy to uh, see. And uh, the brightest star in that constellation is Alpha, because Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and it's given to the brightest star in a constellation. So my favorite star, in a sense, is uh, Alpha Cas. I've, I've never taken any observation uh, of that star, but in a sense, it's my favorite because it brings me back to childhood memories of stargazing. Awesome. Uh, so Jasmine also has a follow-up question for Lori asking, um, is NGC 628 considered to be a starburst galaxy? Ah, um, it is not, but to me it is. <laughs> so so the, it's kind of a fuzzy definition. So when you call a galaxy a starburst, it's because it's forming so many stars per year um, that, that it like it is just like, yeah. It's just like completely inflamed by star formation. And in the universe, you have a lot of starbursts that are due to different phenomena in space. So for, for example, sometimes galaxies collide uh, with each other and they merge. And we call that mergers. And when you have a merger, often the clouds of gas from both galaxies compact themselves together and it kind of trigger all those stars to form at the same time. And when that happens, those stars light up at the same time and then they push a lot of gas away and it creates those extreme objects with like, it's, it's really messy. Um, and GC628 is not as messy as a starburst that has like those merging properties. It is like a nice spiral galaxy with a disk. There's no other galaxy around it to kind of like perturbate it or anything. And still, even though there's nothing extreme around it, it is still forming a lot of stars. So I like it because of the simplicity of it. And the fact that I can look at all those stars, star forming regions, and they are all, all, all by themselves, like very different. And it's uh, easier for me to study. Awesome. So speaking of star forming regions, uh, we all have these amazing photos that are behind us currently. Um, so, Lori, tell us a little bit about yours. Where is it from? You know, what's going on in it? Yeah, so this is this galaxy is called M33. Uh, it's a nearby, very nearby neighbor <laughs> of the Milky Way. Um, it's still a couple of million light years away from us. Uh, so the light takes a couple of million years to get to, to us in, in the telescope. Um, and it's a much smaller galaxy than the Milky Way. It's like a tiny, tiny little galaxy. But uh, when we look at it, uh, so you have like this, the central part, uh, which is much brighter. You have kind of like those spiral arm that we can see too. And it's usually in those spiral arm that the stars are forming. And you have also those massive, uh, like, I don't know if you can see it, but right beside my head here, there's this huge region that is really bright. By itself, this, this actually has a, a name. It's a NGC 604. <laughs> and it is not a galaxy, but it is like just as bright as some galaxy. And it's just a massive star forming region. And in those, there's probably 100,000 stars forming as we speak. And there are also some that are exploding in supernovae. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things going on in, in here. And um, I actually was able to spot a lot of supernovae in that galaxy. They look like little bubble. Uh, so it's, it's what remains after the explosion of the stars. So where was that image taken from? It's an image from CITEL, but I had to work hard to get it together. So CITEL is a spectral imager. So it's doing um, rainbows with images. Uh, and, and therefore I have those huge data set that are in the shape of the cube. You have an image and every um, image inside the cube have different colors. And so I can go and pick different colors and uh, put them together to create a nice image like this. Uh, so I put some blue, some red, uh, some of the green all together. 
and actually the, the colors are real. So it is kind of what you would see with your own eyes. It's just enhanced a little bit, you know, <laughs> to, 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 to make it easier to see the, the star forming regions. Very cool. What about you, Nadine? What's the image behind you? It's also an image that was taken at CPHP, of course, but with a different instrument, the one that's called Megacam. It is an imager. It takes images and only images. It's not doing also spectroscopy like Titel. But if you take images in diff with different filters, you can add all those images and create a color image. So that's what you see behind. And there's information in the colors that you see. Um, first of all, you see a lot of little points of light, those are all stars, and it starts within our own galaxy. So we're much closer than uh, with the image that Lori is sh was showing. My dogs are barking. <laughs> all right. Um, and then you <laughs> so you see, you see gas, which is colored pink and sometimes blue. And you also see dark clouds of dust. That's the dark areas. And I'll stop there. All right, so I'll do a quick on uh, my image as well, uh, since we're here. So mine's actually taken by our instrument WearCam. And this is an imager a lot like the MegaCam uh, instrument is. So that's the image behind Nadine. Um, but mine is not looking at optical waves li wavelengths like Nadine's is. Mine's actually looking at the infrared instead. And that's, uh, it's different from MegaCam in that using infrared, we can see things behind like the, the gas and the dust that you would see in Nadine's image. Um, and you can see all those stars behind instead of looking at the gas. So that's kind of the difference between Nadine's image and mine is the different instrument that's on. Uh, so let's go back to some more questions from our viewers. Um, so starting, we have a couple from Wesley in Boston. Uh, his first question is, what's the difference between an asteroid and a meteor? Well, I, can I can't take that. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Lori. So, so yeah, an asteroid, um, usually when we talk about an asteroid in space, uh, we have different, uh, so there's a lot of objects in the solar system that are not as big as planets. Um, they are like meters, uh, kilometer wide. Uh, they sometimes are aligned in different structure like the, the asteroid belt uh, that is right um, beyond Mars orbit. Um, so all the objects inside uh, the asteroid belts are asteroids. <laughs> there are some that are also floating around, some that come close to us. Uh, it is also known that some asteroid fell on the Earth, um, but it doesn't happen often. And those are uh, quite big objects that, that just float around and are not planets. Uh, a meteor or a meteorite, uh, um, depending on, uh, so, so everything that basically touches the atmosphere and enter the Earth atmosphere starts to shine because of the friction with the atmosphere. So, uh, when you see a meteor, which is a little bit bigger than a meteorite, uh, it's like a ball of fire <laughs> that uh, just crosses the sky. And uh, sometimes they are big enough to touch the ground, but most of them, if not like 99% of them, uh, basically consume uh, in, in, in the atmosphere because of the heat and, and the friction with the atmosphere. And they go fast. Like one of the crazy thing about them uh, like, I remember, like, the first time I saw those numbers, I was just, like, stunned because uh, they can go 10,000 kilometers per second <laughs> if they're small. <laughs> some, some of them go faster than, faster than bullets. And so that's why they, they basically touch the atmosphere and they just, like, burst. They explode. Wow. Very cool. Uh, so Wesley's next question is, what's your guys' favorite Star Wars character? Can you pick a favorite? They're all so good. Well, you know, I like the classics, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, because I'm from that generation. So that's those characters that struck in my mind. Definitely. Yeah, mine is Princess 
Absolutely, yeah. Like, I just can't help it. Like, strong woman, like, good leader. Yeah, she's definitely the best. <laughs> I think my favorite would have to be R2-D2. That too. <laughs> um, a question from Jane in Boston. Um, we had an image recently of the bubble nebula on our social media. So can one of you tell us a little bit more about what the bubble nebula is? Who wants to take that one? I can take it. <laughs> so if, if I'm correct, like, because uh, I, I, I don't have the image right in front of me, but uh, um, I think the bubble nebula is a uh, planetary nebula. Um, I'm going to like, Give me like two seconds. I'm just going to make sure I'm not like mixing that object with another one. I'm going to Google it here. I can, yeah, you can put it on full screen actually so that everybody um, can see which one we're talking about here. So this right here is the bubble nebula for anyone who did not see our, uh, I think this post was from last week, Friday about our astronomy image of the month. So this is the bubble nebula. Oh yeah, okay, I know now. Then, so it's not a planetary nebula. It's uh, it's the nebula that is formed around a star that has to be kind of massive, much more massive than the sun. So some stars that have like ten times the mass of the sun, they get in two phases where they have those what we call stellar wind. So it's the wind from a star, and of course, it's not like the wind we have on the atmosphere here. It's um, the star basically pushing material around itself. So it suddenly starts to blow material out. And um, it, it goes fast. Uh, again, like thousands of kilometers per second in some cases. And they, they create those bubbles that start expanding. But of course, these, these phases of like uh, stellar wind don't last long. So they basically eject the material. It creates that shell that continuously expands and that's what we see uh, now. So that bubble has like this, this size, which is probably very, very large. And it was because of that tiny little phase where when the stars started to, 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 to expel some, some material outside. Very cool. All right, so next question we have is from Kathy in Pittsburgh. And her question is, will the average person ever be able to go to the moon? Maybe. Uh, not sure. So <clears throat> there are plans right now to go to the moon, but we're going to send trained astronauts. If we succeed in doing that, I can only assume that a decade or two after that, a ordinary person with just you know, basic training uh, might be able to take a short trip to the moon on a short vacation some interesting sites. Yeah, I think that one of the, the hardest part is probably the, the takeoff because you have to sustain so many Gs, like the, the pilots and those, uh, those army planes that goes really, really fast. So maybe normal people would pass out and they would be okay after. <laughs> Just have to go over the initial getting out of the atmosphere, right? Uh, we have a follow-up question from Jane um, about the bubble nebula image, and she asks how the colors of the images are created. I can, I can answer that question like two different directions. The colors that you see in an image or any of the colored image that you see in our backgrounds are made by uh, using an instrument that takes images in different filters, like a blue filter, a green filter, yellow filter, red filter. And then we combine all those images to create a colored one. And as you can see, it's not kinds of colors uniformly over the picture. Some areas are blue, other areas are maybe pink or red. And all of those colors give us an indication of the physical process that is going on. It can be light reflected on tiny grains of dust, or it can be light emitted by atoms or molecules that are 
provided by a hot star. So the color is like, it gives us a hint of what's going on in that particular location um, in space. Cool. So our next question is again from Kathy in Pittsburgh and she says that she read somewhere that the galaxy M51 um, is a small galaxy that eats the big galaxy. And she's wondering if that information is correct. So I can probably answer that one. I, I know M51, I love that galaxy. I think it's called the cartwheel uh, as well. Uh, it has like this galaxy, uh, when you look at it, there's a galaxy up north to the image that is like a little bit more uh, like a, a big ball of stars. And then you have that nice spiral uh, right beside it. And they are interacting. So yes, they are merging. Uh, and um, the cartwheel galaxy M51 is actually distorted by the gravity of the other galaxy. And I, uh, if I recall correctly, M51 is a little bit more massive than its companion. So the smaller galaxy is actually a little bit smaller. Um, and all is gas, because uh, the small galaxy looked like a ball of star. All the gas that was there before was already kind of attracted into M51. And, uh, and it, it, it's basically stripped of gas. So there's only stars remaining. And eventually the, the, the stars and that tiny little galaxy will also merge in M51 and will create a bigger galaxy with more stars. Very cool. Uh, and sorry, that question was actually from Alan, not Kathy. Thank you, Alan, for the question. Um, next from Jasmine, uh, this is going back for Lori, asking um, if the red color in the star forming regions of the galaxy behind you, if that's predominantly due to H alpha. Yes, definitely. So when I, I pick the colors to, to create that image, uh, I actually combine uh, the hydrogen atom and the nitrogen atom together to get more signal. And I choose the, those two together. They are really close in, in the rainbow <laughs> and they are also in the red uh, part of the, the rainbow. And I stack them, I created that red layer and uh, we see other colors. Some, and I think the one right above here on the corner is a little bit more green. So when you see the greenish uh, uh, colors, it's more the oxygen uh, lines uh, from the oxygen atoms that are showing up. And usually that tells me when it's really green, uh, it's often because there's a more massive star exciting more uh, the, uh, the atoms around. And uh, it, it makes the oxygen shine a lot uh, when you have those really massive ones. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Guillaume from Quebec who says hi to Lori. Uh, and he appreciates hearing about Satel and seeing science done with it. So good job. <laughs> uh, another question I have it, for you, for both of you is who was your biggest role model growing up? Who got you into astronomy? I'm not sure if I had a big role model myself. Um, I got into astronomy just by reading. I was curious, so I read books, I read magazines, I watched documentaries on TV. I was trying to get my hand on everything I could. Um, however, in mm -hmm. Quebec, there is Hubert Reeves, who is very famous. Um, he lived in uh, Montreal for a while. He is an astrophysicist. He studies nuclear reactions and how they relate to big, the Big Bang, nucleosynthesis, first elements created in the, um, in the universe. So he has written a lot of books, but his books are really interesting because he goes beyond just the hard scientific facts. He thinks about humans, what it means to be human, living on planet Earth, taking care of our planet Earth. And he is still publishing wonderful books that merge a little bit of philosophy, spirituality, and astronomy all together. So I would say that that could be a um, one of my role models, a name that struck in my mind, and somebody whose books I read um, as all right, great. What about you, Lori? 
Yeah, similar. I don't have like a big role model. I think that a lot of things influenced me into doing like in, into being an astronomer. Um, like when everybody like I, when I get that question, like, why are you doing astronomy? Like if, if I have to think back <laughs> when the little Lori thought about when she decided to go in there, I think um, I was just curious about and trying to understand everything around me. And yes, I was watching those Star Trek series and uh, there was also um, Stargate and like it, there was a lot of things about space and I was just so curious and eager to, to learn more. And once I got uh, in physics and then, you know, my, my supervisor, Carmel Robert, I think was probably uh, the main, you know, the main character, the female character that was there with me and was basically uh, helping me through, through my studies. So, so definitely it was, it was something important for me and I'm sure it, uh, it helped me uh, to, to do my master and then being willing to, to start a PhD. <laughs> Very good. So we're coming on the end of our time here. Uh, so I have one final question for both of you. And it's, uh, do you have any advice to give a, the students that are out there? Well, for a student that is interested in astronomy, it's uh, show that you are interested, research, get books, go online, uh, read pages or blogs, check the NASA website, uh, look for documentaries. If there's a planetarium or a science museum nearby where you live, go check out their planetarium shows and what they have to offer. And then as you get older, take science courses, physics, and math and chemistry, try to figure out a science fair project that would be related to astronomy. Uh, look up the sky, uh, try to learn to figure out how constellations work and what the different types of objects look like in the sky. Yeah, what I, what I would uh, tell uh, students that, uh, that would like to do astronomy is uh, it seems to be like when, when you start, it seems to be a long way. But believe me, time goes fast, and up you get a PhD, and uh, <laughs> and you haven't even realized how we get up there. And <laughs> and uh, if you're passionate and motivated, uh, don't listen to anyone. Just like be bold and and keep doing it. Um, and and doing science is, you know, uh, some some good results, some bad results. It uh, it really varies and. Um, the good results and the good moment really worth it. Um, and you have to go through these different um, challenges, uh, but just keep going. <laughs> great. That's great advice from both of you guys. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I think that is about it. Uh, do you guys have any final words before we go? Well, if you happen to hear my dogs howling, they are named Orion, Cassiopeia, and Moon, and they say hi. <laughs> Very spacey. I love it. Uh, feel free to, uh, to send us any other questions that you might have. Like, uh, I, I'd love answering them by email if I can. <laughs> yeah, great point, Lori. Definitely, if you guys out there have any more questions for either of these two, um, you can always send an email to our outreach director or find their emails on our website as well. So I want to give a huge thank you to both these wonderful astronomers here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days um, to come and talk to us today. Um, and also thank you to everyone who gave us great questions. Those were fantastic questions and we definitely appreciate them. Uh, this was only day three of our virtual star party for CFHT this year. Um, we still have a few other events coming up. Um, tomorrow we have crafts with Mary Beth. Uh, Friday we have a um, video from our director Doug Simons. And lastly we have a virtual stargazing event um, live from the visitor station. So you can do that well right in your home. You can watch them. Uh, take these images of the night sky while they're up at the visitor station. So lots of fun events. Definitely keep checking out our social media for the rest of this week. Um, and with that, mahalo for joining us today. We appreciate it and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.
Bye.